Good morning. My father used to shake his head and say, The dog's religion makes the devil dance with joy. He called them the Nazi pointer dogs because the Nazis used to make them point out the Jews and help them find the partisans. <clears throat> Even the Nazis hated them. Many times the Nazi officers would not permit their troops to take part in the slaughter of Jewish families at the killing pits, where the dogs claimed that they could kill 10,000 Jews a day. When the next Panzer Nazi Panzer troops took Slomonsk, there was no more talk about trying to get me back to Moscow. There simply was no way to do it. As I said, David, I do not want to write or talk just about the war, but I do want you to know how I felt then and how I feel now. I am a hockey fan. I like to go to the games in Moscow. I have seen the Soviet national team playing against the Canadian and the American teams on television. I become very agitated and my wife says that I should stop watching. Western players <clears throat> are taught to stress intimidation and our players are taught to stress technique. <clears throat> Excuse me. Your games have endless fights and are so boring. European players do try and avoid these violent confrontations. Last year I saw a game that was played in the town of Hartford in your state in America. A Soviet player was deliberately hit in the face with a stick. The cut required many stitches to close. The guilty player was only punished with a 10-minute penalty. I felt a surge of anger that I haven't felt in many years. Nadine tells me to stop watching. She says that the Soviet players are now learning to play the same kind of hockey as the Americans. She hates it and calls it macho madness. To tell the truth, I was kind of disappointed in myself. Here I was in a rage and screaming that the American player should have been arrested. It is not the man, Nadine said. It is the must-win society. If you create such a situation and put men in it, that is how they will act. Even though the Soviet players are instructed not to fight back, they soon will be playing the same game, if that's what it takes to win. I wanted to argue, David, but I knew she was right. As a 17-year-old boy, I hated no one, but I soon became the same kind of animal as the ones in the gray coats with their red swastikas. That is what I want to say to you, my cousin. I took my medals and I was happy to be alive and on the winning team. But the truth is, I still fill with shame when my mind sends me pictures about the war. The first terrible winter of 1941 and 1942, my father made me a permanent guard. I was always left with my 17-year-old friend, Sergius, to guard the camp, or we were the rear guard looking out when the others went out on a raid. One day, Sergius convinced me, convinced my father, that he was from the very area that we were in and that he knew the woods well. He said that he knew of a farm nearby and that I could go and see if the Hitlerites were there and if it was not protected we might be able to get some food. My father finally agreed after giving us strict orders not to fire our rifles unless we were fired upon first. I was so excited about him letting us go out alone. I learned week li weeks later that someone had already been out in that area scouting and had found it to be a safe area. That is why he had let us go. When we approached the farmhouse, Sergius grabbed my arm and pulled me to the ground. Four Nazi soldiers came out of the house carrying food. I do not remember what they had. Perhaps it was some eggs, black bread, maybe some cheese. They must have been scouring for food the same way that we were. All of us at the camp had been sharing the same potato soup and potato pancakes for days. We followed the Nazi in, Nazis into the woods and I was so afraid that they might eat some of the precious food that I forgot everything else that I had been told. I was thinking only with my stomach. When I thought that the time was right, I fired, and Sergius fired. We killed all four of them. We took the food back to camp, and we were welcomed with our two large baskets. When we told the lie that we had been fired upon first and had killed four Nazis, we were praised, and it was decided that we were both to be given new sharpshooter rifles. Nikolai was not in favor of the idea, but he had to treat us the same as the others. After much debate, ten of us were assigned to go on a raid 
back to the farm that night. We wanted to beat the Nazi to what was left, and we knew that we would have to move out our camp because the Eitzengruppen would sweep the area after discovering that they had lost four men. If my father ever found out that I had fired first, compromising our position for a little food, I am sure that I would have been severely punished. I was so happy that he was not going on the raid with us. I was afraid that the rifles of the dead Nazis would be picked up, and if they were there, then someone might be able to tell that I had fired first. When we reached the farm, we all knew that something was very wrong. We soon discovered that a Nazi unit was hiding in the house, and they had others posted in the woods. My stupidity has let, had led us into a Nazi ambush. Our leader was an older man, not unlike Gregoria, who had hunted and fished in the area all of his life. His instincts were to be trusted. He sent Sergius and I, with two others, back into the woods to find the Nazis that he knew were hiding there. When the fighting had ended, we had lost two men and killed six Nazis. Four were killed in the house and two in the woods. It wasn't luck. It was the skill of our leader. Germain Senkowitz. He knew the area so well that he sent us directly to where he knew the Nazis would be hiding, and when he heard our fire, he attacked the house. <clears throat> we did find some food, but not enough to make up for the loss of our two comrades. <clears throat> we wiped out an entire Nazi patrol, but we did not return to camp happy. The Nazi would get his revenge on civilians. That night as we were moving our camp, Sergius and I went into the woods and had a talk. We vowed that we would never ever disobey an order again. We felt responsible for the loss of our two men. David, that was my first taste of the real war, and I know that I had been transformed that day. I was separated from my real being and stayed that way until the end of the war. After the breakthrough at Stalingrad and the Great Red Army Offensive began, the Nazi raised the level of intensity, as your hockey coaches like to tell their players to do, especially if they are losing in the third period. It was hard to believe, then, that the vicious animal that invaded our land could become more vicious, but he did. The shame of it all was that we also raised the level of intensity. The Nazi burned houses that were intact, they raped women, and hung civilians as they retreated. One day we raided a village that was no more than five homes. The inhabitants all belonged to a secret religious cult and worked on a huge dairy farm. <clears throat> we had heard that there was a particularly cruel Eitzengrupper officer there who had a girlfriend that lived in the home. We found him and shot him and some of his troops before we pulled out. When we returned, we found that the Nazi reinforcements that had arrived too late to save their officer burned all of the buildings and hung five people including the officer's girlfriend. They claimed that there was an informer among them. When I looked up and saw the frozen bodies hanging there, I remembered that I did not feel anything. I felt no pity, no remorse for being responsible for their deaths. They were just more dead bodies. I had seen so many by that time that it was like looking at trees. I only grieved when one of our partisans died. I broke down when Sergius was killed. My father and the rest of the people in the camp said nothing, although I knew how they all felt. Sergius had filled our quiet moments with his lovely songs and nourished us with his constant smile. At the beginning, my father used to give frequent political lectures and explain why we are fighting and what our duties will be to the state after the war. During one of these lectures, Sergius referred to the enemy as Germans. Nikolai frowned and pointed a finger at Sergius. They are not Germans, he shouted. Germans are back in Germany. If we call these killers Germans, we will think of them as people. They are not people. They are mindless idiots who have given their minds to Hitler. They are Hitlerites, Nazis, and fascists. But they are not Germans. Sergius asked another question. How did they get to be Hitlerites and Nazis and fascists? Everyone laughed, but not my father. There's nothing funny about that, he said. Fear made them surrender their minds. Remembering, remember all of you, blind faith is for idiots and contrary to Marxist teachings. 
<clears throat> Does that mean we no longer have to dig latrine holes? Sergius whispered in my ear and drawing the fire from Nikolai's eyes. A woman standing behind us heard what he had said and repeated it out loud. Everyone laughed, including our leader, who reminded us that we were soldiers, and while he didn't expect blind faith, he did expect obedience. So keep your shovels clean. Oh, how we all miss Sergius. He was killed when a mine he was planting exploded prematurely. To this day, I never describe our wartime enemy as the Germans. None of us do. Luba does not. It is always the fascists or the Nazis or the Hitlerites. It is so much easier to justify our own actions that way. Toward the end of the war, the objective seemed no longer to be to capture this area or destroy a train. It was to kill as many Nazis as we could kill. We only started to take prisoners when we could turn them over to the regular army. Now I rationalize by saying that I did not invade them and that I did not start the killing. But the fact remains that for three years I was as vicious a killer as any Nazi. And I was very good at it. Permit me one more incident to emphasize the point I am trying to make. <clears throat> one day we had just passed through a small village on the edge of Pierpot Marshes. I must admit that I do not remember exactly where we were. We moved around so much, and I just went where I was told. The Nazis were already fleeing the area, and in the little village they left the hanging bodies of old men, women, and children. They again blamed us for the deaths because the day before we had blown up a truck carrying Nazi troops. About ten of us moved through the village. We knew that the Hitlerites were near, but nearby. Falouche, a young Pole who had escaped from a Nazi work camp and had joined us, spotted the Nazi headed for the marsh. They were young, green, replacement troops and knew little about traveling in the marsh. They were obviously trying to get back to their unit after being out on a patrol. We soon had them encircled. Felouche, who was next to me, began to giggle and shake his head. Their boots are stuck in the mud, he said, his shoulders shaking with laughter. The Nazis knew that there was no way out and they had decided to surrender. As two of them began to raise their arms, Felouche opened fire. Others did also. We killed all six of them. I did not fire my rifle. I could see their faces, and some of them were my age. How do I remember it? Because I, I have seen it in my dreams for years. David, these are just flashes of the war that I wanted you to see because they illustrate the capacity of those who call themselves good men to raise the level of intensity, as the hockey coaches say. Can you imagine the level that will be reached after the first atomic weapon is fired at an enemy capable of firing one back? After May 9th, when the Nazis surrendered, my father and I only had one thing on our minds. As you can imagine, we both became obsessed with the reports from the prisoner camps, like millions of Belarusians and Soviet citizens everywhere. As the camps were liberated, there was heart in hand searching for relatives. Reliable information was hard to come by. We had no idea of what had happened to Gregoria, Luba, or, Sash, or Sarah. We never heard one word from any of the camps about them. So many Belarusians were shipped to work camps in Poland and Germany, and of course, we had seen the many hanging bodies. Nikolai kept trying to keep everything in perspective. He let me hope, but with his reality of our chances of finding them. David, there were times when our group would pick up whole families. They would stay with us for long periods of time. It was not easy for a band of partisans to find a safe place for women and children who might have seen their entire village burned and had nowhere to go. When the shooting stopped, we all searched for our loved ones. Nikolai and I got leave from our duties and both of us went to Pinsk to begin our search. We felt that we might get some information from the refugees that were being processed there. At first we were rebuked by the officers in charge, but Nikolai was more than a colonel in the army. He was a local and state hero. He used that influence. Those in charge were trying to keep some kind of order and establish a system. It was very difficult to manage the many relatives who converged on them daily with emotional pleas to be given some word about their loved ones. It was a chaotic situation 
as I am sure you can visualize. <clears throat> For a great many of the refugees, there were no homes or even villages to send them back to, and almost all needed some type of medical treatment. <clears throat> many were so malnourished that even their close relatives didn't recognize them at first. The very day that we arrived in Pinsk, both my father and I began to feel the human blood flow again. We were overwhelmed by the memories of our youth. For the first time, I began to feel the anguish of the millions of suffering Soviet people, and I also began to feel euphoria about surviving. The refugees had a profound effect on Nikolaya. He kept waving to those on the road that were walking toward Minsk. Strat! Comrade, he would call to them, and many lifted their heads, raised their fist, and managed a weak smile back. I shall never forget that trip to Pinsk. Nikolai Grigorievich was born with the ability to see not just the scenes as most of us do, but entire panorama. <clears throat> he also had the enviable talent to project himself into the future. That day, while looking at the weary, bedraggled Soviet citizens making their way back to a home that most likely was no longer there, he saw a most joyous scene. There in front of him was a picture that would depress anyone. The scorched earth, roads with bomb holes in them, land devoid of crops or animals, villages, towns, and even cities totally destroyed. That is what my eyes saw. But Nikolai kept repeating over and over, Wait, my son, wait until you see the new Marxist state that they will build now. We have saved the baby again. We looked at faces that all looked the same and asked questions about our relatives that always got the same answers and the same shaking of heads. As the sun began to cast long shadows behind the lines of humanity along the road, we decided to make one last trip, one fast trip to Gregoria's farm. We knew that no one would be there, but we just wanted to see what was left. It didn't take us long to realize that we would never make it in time to get back to our duties. It was a long four or five hour trip back to Minsk. The roads were clogged with people. I remember asking my father, where are they all going? They are going home, he answered. But there is no home, I answered through clenched teeth, trying to hide the emotion. Of course there is, my father said. They will go home and they will rebuild. They know what it is that they must do. A new Soviet state will help them. We both knew that at the pace that we were traveling, we could not make it to the farm on this trip. Intending to turn around, Nikolaya pulled the lorry over to the side of the road. <clears throat> Excuse me. At that moment, a stooped, bearded man with one arm dangling limply at his side and was slowly putting one foot in front of the other. And he moved past my father's window. Comrade, Nikolaya suddenly called out. Come, comrade, we will take you part way up the road, and you can get some rest. We helped what we thought was a very old man into the seat. At first I was repulsed by the smell of him. He did not speak, but managed to smile. As we moved ever so slowly toward a crossroad, just a few miles away from where Nikolai was going to let the man off and turn back for Minsk. I said that the road to the farm looks to be in good condition. The old man who was listening to our conversation about the familiar sights in the farm suddenly began to shake all over. <clears throat> Excuse me. He started to rock back and forth and say our names over and over. Trushka, Trushka. My father stopped the lorry and lifted the man's head. Moskowitz. He shouted so loud that others stopped to see what was happening. I never saw my father completely let go emotionally before. The two men kissed each other. Sorry. And Colonel Trusko was at once transformed from military man to the father that I had remembered at the farm. Sorry. You can edit this, right? His face relaxed, and through his tears he was smiling. But he soon lost control and began to sob. 
I had to help him out of the truck and hold him in my arms. Moskowitz was talking through his own tears. He was telling us that he was going back to Plotnica, the place that he loved, to die. He said that he knew that it would be soon and that the land was free now so he could go there and die. Then he said something that added violent trembling to my father's throbbing body. Moskowitz said that Sarah and Luba looked well when he saw them last week at the receiving center in Pinsk. He thought that we had already picked them up and brought them back to the farm, of course. Nikolai could not drive, and I turned the lorry around, and ignoring the protests of Moskowitz, we headed back to Pinsk. On the way, my father told his lifelong friend that he wasn't going to die for many, many years, and that the new state was going to need good bakers. They laughed and cried and hugged all the way back. Using his influence again, Nikolai got Moskowitz admitted to the hospital. Everyone is entitled to the same treatment, he told the officer in charge, but Moskowitz is an emergency case. He's very dehydrated. We knew that we would be late getting back to Minsk, but we set about searching for Sarah and Luba. We did not find them, and we both wondered to ourselves if Moskowitz was lucid enough to really recognize my mother and sister. He said that he saw them only for a moment and tried to call out to them, but that they, they did not hear, <clears throat> but that they did not hear and were herded into the building with so many others. He said that he was far too weak to push through the crowd of people. Nikolai placed notes everywhere before we left, and you could see the determination on his face not to let himself go again. We would, of course, do all that we could to find them. But with our emotions in check, we would, of course, do all we could to find them, but with our emotions in check. One week later, we were given permission to spend another day in Pinsk. We were going to take the train, but before we left, we checked the hospital transfer list, the way we always did when they were posted in the morning. And there they were, the names, in black and white. I don't know how long we stared at those names before we began to slap each other and dance around. We knew the train that brought the new patients to the hospital at Minsk was due at midday, and we made plans to be there early. We didn't know why they were hospitalized, and we tried not to think of the worst. As I stood at the train station waiting, with my heart pounding all the time, I kept reminding my father that Moskowitz, Moskowitz said that they had looked well, and he would nod, and, and he smiled. He waited with that tense, tight-lipped face that I saw so many times when we went out on raids. David, it is more than 40 years in the past, and yet I cannot write about it without tears. They both just walked off the train. Nikolai saw them at once and pushed his way to them. I was floating on a sea of rapture, a static humanity moving toward the train. At first there was no hugging or even kissing. Nikolai pulled us all over to the freight loading dock, where, for the first time, I got a close look at my beloved mother and sister. When I left her back at the farm, Luba was a bright, rosy-cheeked, happy, lovely, 21-year-old woman. When I saw her that day, she looked 50. Her hair was thin and gray. Her hair was thin with gray streaks, and her sallow cheeks made her face look drawn and haggard. Sarah seemed to weather the ordeal a little better. I hugged Luba until we, they made me let her go, and my mother did the same to me. Luba was the only patient, but Sarah refused to leave her, so they put both names on the roster for the hospital. Luba was suffering from acute depression, and like Moskowitz, she was badly dehydrated. She was speaking of suicide before the war had ended. My mother said that we could, do no more, we could do more for her than anyone else. As you can imagine, housing in Minsk was as hard to find as stoves to cook on. Soldiers were pressed into the construction business, putting up shelters, and Nikolai managed to find us a place where we had to share the kitchen with three other groups, but no one seemed to mind. We were alive, and we had a future, and that is all that mattered. In the evenings, we talked mostly about what we did before the war and what our plans for the future were. No one spoke about the war except to wonder whatever happened to Gregoria or how Moskowitz was doing. 
We often speculated about Gregoria, and the consensus was that he died with many Soviet soldiers in the internment camps in Pinsk. <clears throat> that is what they also did with prisoners who were not Jews and were of no use to the Nazis. They just let them die. David, one haunting thought comes back to me when I think of those first days that the family was together. Most of us were suffering from a strange malady, one that medicine could not cure and doctors could not identify. I can give you only the symptoms. I was so ashamed of what I had become during the war. I must admit that there were times when Sergius and I actually got a joy out of killing. Sociologists perhaps can document why, throughout our history, many societies have lost their structure and the ability to control the citizens and leaders helplessly watch the society disintegrate. We were determined that we would not let that happen to the, to the Marxist state. But we, the killers, had to force ourselves back into the, my father's vision and the vision of millions like him. I assume that it is a, a problem that all soldiers returning from war must face. But I know that there was never a war like the one we had in Bielorussia. David, we were living in a world where madness, madmen set out to kill 10,000 innocent people a day. Degenerate, villainous creatures that walked and talked like human beings. They raped children and hung women. They burned the houses of older people when the people were still in them. We saw all that, and then we had to force ourselves back into our close, loving community. We smothered each other with love. We treated our children like little gods. We tried to paint over all the pain with ro wide brushes of affection. I know that my father was nationalistic to a fault, but I understood that because he had seen socialism grow from the first breath into a giant. He was very proud of it. The socialist state was his baby. Young soldiers like me didn't have his confidence. We always had the next war in the back of our minds and the question of whether it could be as horrible as the last one. That fear not only remained, but grew with all old Soviet soldiers during the Cold War years. I tried to teach my own children and all young Soviets who would listen that we can never let our nationalism blot out the logic and the humanism of Karl Marx. We must never again let a situation develop that will force us to become the mindless walking dead that slaughtered each other and brought the Belarusian soil to a boil. David, I have always distrusted the professional religionists because it seems to me that their entire purpose in life is to divide people and create hatred of others while they preach the opposite. In my student days, I wrote a piece for my literature class about religion. I titled it with the Latin phrase, Splendid Mendax. It means nobly untruthful or untruthful for what one believes is a good cause. I said then, and I believe now, that the religionists seek only their personal power and that they use the emotion of fear and hatred to get it. One only need look at the div divisive forces being used to goad people into killing their own countrymen in, Ireland, in, in, in India, Ireland, and throughout the Middle East, where one... Nazareth, or argue with the many other messages of peace and brotherhood that most religions espouse. At the end of the war, we did not rely on them to recreate us. We relied on each other. There were millions of Soviet people then who needed some sort of psychodynamic studies, and such studies were done, but I do not think that enough follow-up work was completed. Of course, it would have been a massive task, as the whole nation needed it. I read recently about an American Vietnam veteran testifying to what he called flashbacks. I think that all combat soldiers 
must have them for the rest of their lives. The war shall always be a slideshow in my head that turns off and on at will. Only about a month or so ago, only about a month or so ago, a few of my students from Germany decided to enjoy the beautiful spring weather and have lunch on the grass just above the Moscow River. I too had decided to take my lunch there and I was seated just above them. They were speaking in their own language. I looked at the river and the show clicked on. I could see my friend Sergius smiling as usual and carrying his special rifle. We were returning from a scouting mission near the Eitengruppen headquarters. On the way back, we were cut off by a small Nazi patrol that had two collaborator dogs with them. Sergius pushed me into the icy waters of the marsh, and we crouched there for what seemed like hours, but I know that it was more like ten minutes. The Nazis were about twenty meters above us. We could plainly hear their laughter and their chatter. They had stolen some food and planned to cook it right there before they would have to share it with the others. We waited as long as we could, but I had just about decided to attack because I could no longer feel my feet and we had heard many lectures about soldiers losing their feet to frostbite and how to avoid it. I felt we had nothing to lose and started to stand up when a real dog began barking in the woods. The Nazis decided to see what was causing the barking. That was enough of a diversion for Sergius and I to open fire and kill them. We did not expect to survive because we thought that it was a full squad of partisan hunters. When Sergius counted only two Nazis and two dogs, he began to laugh. For that we froze our feet, he said, and ignoring the danger, sat down and began to eat the hot soup the Nazis had warmed for themselves. It is hard to believe that anyone could laugh in a situation like that, but you become encased in a coating of emotion-proof armor, and laughter that Sergius always seemed to have ready was not really laughter at all, but an acquired protection against reality. Yes, David, I still have the slideshows. I mention that because like the sport of hockey, I, al I, al I also like basketball. I like them because both are sports played in the wintertime indoors. I view ski enthusiasts and those who sit above a hole in the river waiting for a fish to jump out or take their bait as slightly out of balance. I see no hope for those who are insane enough to splash in the icy waters of the sea in January. They tell me that all of these things are good for your health. I don't believe it. I can never get warm enough. Not in the winter, not in the summer. I love to go to the steam bath and just cook myself. Nadine warns me that it is unhealthy. I do not care. One picture in my slideshow is a mound of snow with just my eyes sticking out of it. I spent nearly an entire day in one of those mounds and never thought that I would live. Sergius and I and other sharpshooters used to hide in such mounds of snow and let the Hitlerites chasing our unit go by. When our comrades opened fire in front of them, we could get them from behind. One day, I was the only one in the snow because there was only a small band of Nazis spotted. But they were a decoy, and my comrades in front were faced with an ambush and had to get out of the area. The Nazis stayed for a long time, and I could not emerge from the snow until almost daybreak. Sergius and my father came for me, and when they saw that I was still alive, they began to call me Father Frost, a joke that stayed with me until the end of the war. <clears throat> Nikita Khrushchev will always remain as one of my heroes, but I can remember when he got into serious trouble by saying an offhand remark that he would like to do away with all of the monuments and all of the war memorials and stop glorifying the war. We owe it to the children, he said. We make them feel that they have missed something. That remark almost cost him his political life. It was an idea that was a half a century at least before its time, but then so was Nikita. As I said, I do not think that we, the Soviet people, did enough to help the citizens like Luba put their lives back together. She did have psychiatric counseling, and that is what led her into the, her present work. She did not know until we were all living together in Minsk that her Valerie had been shot down very early in the war. I know that many men were attracted to her, but she rejected them all when the relationship became serious. I still tell her that she speaks too much, that she spends too much time in the past. Excuse me. She often visits the graves of our parents 
and just last week, while watching a movie on, the tele on television, she began to relate the events of when we were reunited at the railway, railway station in Minsk. She had brought a friend of hers to dinner, to our, of hers to dinner at our apartment. Nadine always loved to have Luba and her friends come by. That day, I was in the kitchen, getting, getting the after-dinner coffee ready, when Luba called me. She was all excited and shouted at me to hurry, hurry. In the picture, a young soldier was about to sing a song. It was a song that Sergius taught me in 1942. I still remember the words. Of course I do. How could I forget such a thing? I remember singing the song for my family when we moved into that shanty house the first night that we were all back together. I will tell you the words, but you must remember that the English words may have the same meaning as the Russian words, but they do not rhyme the same way. I am sure my cousin that you can imagine what these words mean to Luba and I. Wait for me, and I'll return. Only wait very hard. Wait when you are filled with sorrow as you watch the yellow rain. Wait when the winds sweep the snowdrifts. Wait in the sweltering heat. Wait when the others have stopped waiting, forgetting their yesterdays. Wait when even from afar no letters come to you. Wait when others are tired of waiting. Wait even when my mother... I'm sorry, wait one second. Ay, ay. It's hard to believe I've read this 50 times, right? Wait when even my mother and son think that I am no more, <clears throat> and when friends sit around the fire and drink to my memory. Wait and do not hurry to drink to my memory, too. Wait, for I will return, defying every death. Let those who did not wait say that I was lucky. They will never understand that in the midst of death, you with your waiting saved me. Only you and I will know how I survived. It's because you waited and no one else did. In answer to her friend's question at the end of the movie, Luba began to relate the tear-evoking story about our post-war post reunion in Minsk. I tried to interrupt her and told her that no one wants to hear such stories anymore. She said the old war, war movies are not very popular here now, but her friend, <clears throat> who was from France and worked with the underground in Paris during the Nazi occupation, encouraged her. Soon we were all singing songs of that time and drinking wine and crying. The importance of the jobs that both Luba and I were fortunate enough to get the stimulation of our new political activities, our studies at the university, and the fear of looking back helped Luba and me start our new lives. We were also helped a great deal by our wise and loving parents who resisted the desire to go back to Plotnica and rebuild their old lives. With the farm collectivized, Nikolaya and Sarah both could have gone back and lived out the remaining years on the land that they loved. But Nikolaya was obsessed with the idea of having his children well-educated, and the schools in the rural areas took longer to rebuild. They did so much for us, but I think that the academic guidance was the most important. Luba did not have the confidence to go on to advanced school because she had been educationally deprived, especially during the Polish occupation. With my parents' help, she became a leader in her field. To this day, the many war orphaned children she has helped still write to her and come to see her. Oh, David, and so it did happen. I was afraid that if I took my finger out of the dike, I would drown in the emotion of the endless stories of that chapter in our history when the whole world seemed to go insane at the same time. I am sorry if I rambled on. After reading your book about the, your involvement in the civil rights struggle in the 60s, we are all anxious here 
to learn more of your uh, to have more of your insight into your motivation and your analysis of the results vis-a-vis -vis the situation today. I close with a wish of joy and good health to you and to your family. Sincerely, Cousin Sasha. And thank you very much, and I will be back for Chapter 6. Thank you.